Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar that uh, ICER is uh, sponsoring. We've sponsored a series of webinars this spring uh, talking about issues important to Alaska. We uh, had a couple on uh, work being done at uh, Anchorage on the COVID uh, pandemic. Today, we're going to shift gears. Uh, today, uh, Brett Watson is going to present a uh, some research that he and a couple of other folks completed. Uh, the title of that is uh, Commercial Fisheries and Local Economies. Uh, before I get into some introductory comments, just some mechanical aspects. Um, the most important one is that uh, if you have questions for Brett, uh, if you could put them in the Q&A box, uh, not the chat box. I know some folks, uh, some seminars use the chat box. In our case, we'll be monitoring the Q&A box. Also note that the Q&A box has the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, vote, what's called the voting up option. That is, if you have a question and you realize it's already there uh, or it's similar to the question that's already there, uh, you can uh, indicate that you too would like to have that question answered. I'll be monitoring that, that, that uh, Q&A box. Uh, Brad is gonna talk for about 45 minutes and then the last 10 to 15 minutes will be used for Q&A and I will, uh, after monitoring the questions, uh, ask them uh, of Brett. Uh, this seminar is also being recorded on YouTube and that should be available uh, in a couple of days. So uh, let me introduce Brett first. Uh, Brett is uh, in his fourth year at ICER. He has been a postdoc uh, working on a variety of issues, but primarily uh, on fisheries uh, issues, although he's worked on other things as well. And, and this is an outgrowth of that work. He actually has uh, three co-authors on this paper. One is Musim Gatabi. Musim uh, has a joint appointment between ICER and the Department of Economics uh, at CBPP. Uh, the second co-author is Matt Reimer. Matt Reimer left ICER about a year ago uh, and uh, is now at uh, University of California, Davis. Uh, Matt was really instrumental in uh, putting together the, uh, the work that led to uh, Brett coming to ICER as a postdoc. And the final co-author is um, uh, Alan Heine. Uh, Alan is uh, an, uh, an economist with NOAA in the Alaska Fisheries uh, uh, Center in Seattle. And I'm, I'm sure that uh, Brett will mention uh, Alan's role in terms of some of the, the data that uh, was used in this study, as well as the methodology. In introducing Brett, I want to say this particular seminar is one uh, that I think really illustrates what I think ICER does when we're at our best. Um, that is, this is an issue that's obviously important to Alaska. Fisheries are important. How commercial fisheries affect our economies uh, is important. But more broadly, um, we're able, this study does something that we also try to do in ICER, and that is to use the unique circumstances of Alaska to uh, better understand some problems that may exist elsewhere. And in our case, uh, fisheries are an issue in rural economies uh, around the US, but the reality is that in most states, even my home state of Maine, uh, where fisheries are seen as important, they're a very small part of the economy. And, and teasing out what is the impact of fisheries for macro data, can be very complicated uh, simply because uh, the getting a signal out of all that noise can be hard. Alaska, because of its unique situation, it's really the only state where fisheries are a very significant part of the economy. It is easier to figure, to see what are the impacts of fishing activity uh, on our economy. Another aspect is that Alaska does have some unique data sets, some unique data sets gathered by our uh, fisheries management agencies, but also uh, managed by our uh, Department of Labor. And this study, again, uses that unique data that's available for Alaska to examine some questions that are important. And that's what's really, I think, interesting about this work is that it tries to ask and answer questions that are really important for the rest of the economics profession. Questions about how well do, does our economic methodology work in answering the questions that we want to ask. And moreover, it asks those questions even risking the possibility that the answers we get are just a little bit uh, uncomfortable. That is that those answers may challenge the received wisdom that's based on, uh, in some cases, 
uh, methodologies that, that we all know have some weaknesses, but we've never gone back uh, to test. And finally, uh, I'm really pleased that Brett is making this presentation. I've seen uh, Brett's presentations elsewhere, and I know that Brett it really is an exemplar for what ICER tries to do in having people who can translate what is technical economic analysis into material that's understandable and usable uh, by a broader audience. I'm gonna say just a little bit about this study. I should say that uh, I'm an economist by training and it turns out an economist who did fisheries economics uh, in a number of places, but primarily in Maine uh, and in New Zealand. And I, like probably a, a number of uh, people sitting in on this uh, uh, conference, have tried to estimate the impact of fishing on uh, economies for lots of reasons. Uh, and almost always we fall back on a methodology called input-output analysis or some variant on input and output analysis. And those of us who use input-output analysis know that input-output analysis involves some heroic assumptions. And, and for the non-technical people, uh, I'll just set Brett up a little bit. For the non-technical people, input-output analysis assumes there is only one way in the world to make a chocolate cake. It takes two cups of sugar, four cups of flour, certain amount of cocoa, et cetera. If flour is expensive, you're not allowed to reduce the amount of flour. It's fixed. Moreover, how this cake is used is also fixed. People in the lower 48 consume one cake per year. People in Alaska consume two cakes per year. These are all very convenient assumptions. This fixed ratios is built into this analysis. And we use a lot of national data. Those of us who do it know that those fixed ratios are an approximation. And we often would like to ask, in our quiet moments, when we've sent the contract off, we'd like to ask ourselves, how good are those assumptions that we've built in? And what's interesting about this uh, project is it tries to take a different approach to try to directly measure the uh, impacts of a particular level of fishing activities without relying on the kinds of assumptions that go into uh, input output analysis and similar uh, methodologies. So I'm really pleased that Brett has uh, chosen to walk us through this problem today. And so uh, once again, if you have questions, please put them in Q&A and I'll uh, uh, monitor those. And Brett, uh, you have the floor now. Yeah, well, thanks, Ralph. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Um, Ralph, am I, is my audio coming through all right? Great. Uh, well, well, thank you, Ralph, for that introduction, and uh, it's a real pleasure to get to present this result, uh, uh, this research to folks that are on the call today. I saw that in the registrants list, there's a lot of people who do uh, work in this space uh, that I have a lot of respect for, and work that uh, honestly is a reference for for some of this uh, uh, this research that I'll be presenting today. And so this is kind of built upon a lot of work that a lot of folks have been doing that are on this call for a long time. Um, Ralph did a really great job kind of queuing up some of the key themes of, of, of the talk today. And so I'll be able to kind of work probably quickly through the first couple of slides for you. Um, so as Ralph said, there's, there's kind of this intrinsic belief, or I, what I would characterize as an intrinsic belief, um, that local economies are uh, closely tied with the commercial fisheries that they participate in. And so I've kind of clipped some headlines from, from different papers around the state to kind of highlight this, this strong linkage. And basically the assumption here is, is if, the, if there, there's some large shock to a fishery, if Bristol Bay has a really bad year uh, in terms of sockeye returns, that the economy of Bristol Bay is surely gonna suffer just these devastating impacts in, in that year or in the following year. And as Ralph said, what we wanted to do in this paper is just kind of put that, um, that kind of intrinsic link to the test using some, some data. Um, so generally speaking, our research question that we're going to try to tackle in this paper is uh, what are the short run economic impacts of commercial fisheries on local economies? And I want to highlight that word short run um, because it's going to end up um, mattering a lot in, in both the, um, uh, the, the way that we frame this question a little bit, but also some of the limitations of the study. So um, importantly, we're not asking the question here, what would happen if commercial fishing were to disappear from the Alaska economy? That's a, obviously a very important question, but it's separate from the one we're asking. 
Instead, what we're looking at is how do those year to year fluctuations that kind of naturally occur based on uh, fluctuations in fish stocks and then the value of the fisheries based on kind of global prices for seafood, um, how do those combine to create fluctuations in value that then influence how local economies are performing? And so that's, that's the question that we're interested in. And again, those long run questions are very interesting and very important. Our research just focuses on a different question. Um, and so specifically what we're gonna try to do in this paper is answer, is answer uh, three, um, three questions related to this more general one, which is does commercial fishing activity spill over into wage and employment outcomes in other sectors? So it's great if fishing can create uh, employment opportunities for fishermen, crew, processing workers, uh, but at the end of the day, it would also, it would be even better if that fishing, uh, that fishing activity spilled over into other spart, bar, parts of the economy, like uh, bars, restaurants, retail employment, and other trades. Um, on that note, we want to know which of these sectors um, in, in these spillover activities are the most affected by commercial fishing activity. And then finally, we want to kind of um, dissect uh, these spillover effects a little bit. Uh, based on geography, we're asking the question, where are these benefits accruing um, if we measure these spillover effects? We want, we want to ask the question, um, who is benefiting uh, and, and where are those folks? And so to answer these questions, as Ralph noted, um, we're going to be taking a statistical approach, um, econometric approach here. Uh, and that's slightly different than the way that some of these questions have been asked in the past and asked and answered in the past. Um, and we think that our approach provides a nice complement to some of that existing body of research. Um, after all, if we can kind of arrive at a similar destination as other folks have um, using a very distinct set of methodology, I think that that's really valuable um, for decision makers to see um, in creating a, um, a more diverse kind of tapestry of information. Uh, so a quick roadmap for the rest of the seminar today. Um, I'm going to start by kind of framing out the rest of our research question, talking a little bit about the past work that's been done on the subject. Ralph did a really great job um, talking about some of the past work that's been done um, using input-output analysis um, and really breaking that down. Like I said, our, our work, I think, provides a nice complement to some of that existing work. Um, I'll then talk about um, the nature of economic spillovers more generally how economists tend to think about this idea of economic spillover effects. And then, as I mentioned, we're, we, we really want to try to understand where these benefits are accruing um, in terms of geography. And so we'll talk a little bit about the geography of fisheries. So after we kind of finish framing up the question, we'll talk about the, uh, the empirical setting here in Alaska, the data that we end up using in the study, some of that unique data that, that Ralph had mentioned. I'll describe our statistical uh, methodology. I'll try to keep this fairly high level, but I think that this is a particularly exciting part of the paper. And so if you're interested in any of the really nitty gritty details there, um, I'd be happy to, to talk to you maybe offline or during the Q&A period. I'll include my contact information at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the presentation if, if you'd like to discuss that in more detail. Uh, and then we get to the more fun and interesting stuff, which I think is the results and then some of the implications of this research. So, so let's go ahead and dive in here. Um, so as Ralph mentioned, most of the work that's been done trying to answer this question of the economic impact of fisheries has used this input-output methodology. Um, so many of you may be familiar, or I think some of you, some of you on the presentation or on the call today might have actually created um, this, uh, this study that McDowell puts out periodically on the economic impact of commercial fishing in Alaska, which is a really great resource. It's, it's one that I reference myself um, pretty often. Um, but as Ralph noted, there's some really important assumptions that go into input-output methods that might be somewhat limiting um, in answering a couple of those more specific questions uh, that, that we are interested in kind of breaking down a little bit. And again, I think that there's a lot of value in, in this input-output methodology, and I think our work provides a really nice complement to it. There's also some work that's been done in um, other natural resource sectors. Uh, by economists uh, looking at natural resources like uh, oil and gas, mining, timber, and what impact they have on local economies. We're going to be drawing a little bit from the methodology that other economists have used to look at other industries and then applying that to the fishing context. And as Ralph said, I think that one of the neat things about our paper is that, um, is that we can speak both to these very specific fisheries issues in the state of Alaska, and then provide some information that's gonna be useful to economists as they think more generally about how uh, people and the natural environment interact with each other. 
So to talk about a little bit about the nature of economic spillovers here, we talk, we use the, the phrase economic impact um, somewhat casually, but I think it's useful to talk about it in, 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 a, a, in a more specific way here. Um, and that's that uh, when we talk about economic impacts, we're talking about measuring the effect of an event on a given economy. And there's two phrases there or two words there that are important to kind of hone in on. One is what we mean by an event and one is what we mean by an economy. Um, so an event could be anything when we do these economic impact analyses. It could be a natural disaster or government policy or maybe closer to our context, a new seafood processing plant. And that impact could have um, uh, different effects depending on how we define the economy. Um, after all, an economy could be a neighborhood, a city, a state, a country, or the entire world. Or it could be particular use or um, groups of people um, interacting in those different places. So it's important to think about what we mean when we say an economy and to define more specifically what we mean by an event. Another useful concept from this, um, this framework that was developed by regional economists is um, to break down the total economic impact into three constituent parts. Um, so uh, regional economists like to think about total economic impacts as being the sum of direct impacts, indirect impacts, and induced effects. So um, going back to that example of a seafood processing plant, the direct effect of a seafood processing plant might be the jobs that are created by that plant, uh, the wages that are earned by those employees, or the value added that that processor is providing um, to, the, uh, to, the, to the economy. Um, but in order for that processor to operate, it needs to be able to secure some inputs um, into its operation. And so that, that processor might need some, some electricity to run its processing line. And so it might ask the local utility company to hook it, hook it up to the power grid. The local utility company might need to stall, install a new power generating unit and hire a couple more people to service and maintenance uh, that unit. And those jobs that are, are, are associated with that, the service and maintenance of kind of that upstream utility company, those are considered to be indirect impacts of that seafood processor. And then finally, when those workers are done at the end of their shift, they're gonna go out into the local economy. Maybe they're gonna go home um, to uh, an adjacent town uh, where they commute from, and they're gonna spend money in those places, either on housing, food, um, uh, leisure activities. And those are all gonna generate uh, induced effects in those businesses. And so we when we think about total economic impacts, it's useful to break it up into these, these three constituent parts, these direct effects, and then these spillover indirect and induced effects. And as I said, as I said it's also useful to, to frame out a little bit the concept of the geography of fishing in the state of Alaska. So I've got a little cartoon here. Um, I put some fish out in the ocean. And, um, and so the first level of geography that's important to think about here is, is where the fish are. Um, the second level of geography that's important is, is, is where the fishermen are living. So in Alaska, we have fishermen that live in our urban areas like Anchorage and Fairbanks, um, but we also have fishermen that live along our coast. Um, uh, here I've got little uh, uh, extra tough boots in Nome and, and Dutch Harbor, uh, but fishermen live across the state of Alaska. And that's a second important layer of geography as we're thinking about fisheries. Uh, we also have fishermen that live outside the state of Alaska. There's a strong contingent of fishermen that come up um, to fish Alaska seafood that reside in Washington state, Oregon, California, and even internationally. Um, so then these fishermen come up to the state of Alaska and they prospect different species of fish. They use different types of equipment when they do that prospecting or that harvesting. Um, and they might fish in different areas for these different species of fish. And so those three things, um, species fi or fishing gear and the area that they're fishing, those uniquely define a fishery. And fishermen might participate in different fisheries over the course of a year. Um, so once the fishermen have caught the fish, they need some place to take that fish to sell it. And that's uh, facilitated through uh, landing their harvest at one of the ports uh, on the coast of, of, of the state. Um, and so fishermen will take their catch and they'll land it at one of these ports. And that defines the third important area uh, when we're thinking about layers of geography here. Um, and so once the fishermen have sold their catch to a port in, in Alaska, um, then they'll return home and they'll take some of the earnings that they made uh, when they sold their fish home with them. And so as we think about these three levels of geography, where the fish are, where the fishermen live, where the fishermen land their catch, there's only, really only two levels of those geographies um, that are gonna be capable of facilitating economic impacts. After all, because there aren't any people that live in the ocean where the fish are, um, economic impacts really 
have to accrue either where the fisher landed or where the fishermen live. You know, there might be other people that are involved in the commercial fishing process. Um, for example, the processing workers or the crew that work on the boats and their home communities are also important. But in our study, we're mostly gonna think about these two levels of geography, where the fishermen live and where the fisher landed as being uh, capable of, of, of receiving economic impacts from, from commercial fishing. And so here's kind of that same cartoon picture with some data overlaid on it. And so this is, this is data from the state of Alaska um, over the period of 2000 to 2015. And what these figures represent are the average harvest based on where fishermen live on the left side of the figure and where the fisher landed on the right side. So those two levels of geography that we mentioned that were important. Uh, the lighter colors here represent lower value of fish that are either caught by fishermen that live there or that are landed into those communities. And those darker colors represent higher level values. And the thing that I, there's two things that I wanna highlight in this figure. One is that on the right hand side figure where fisher landed, we can see that there's not many landings that are going on in the interior of the state of Alaska. And that makes sense, right? There aren't any ports located in the interior. But if we look at the left hand side picture, that doesn't mean that there isn't a commercial fishing activity that goes on in these communities. In fact, we have a lot of fishermen that live in the interior part of the state. Those fishermen are earning uh, revenues when they catch the fish, and then they're potentially bringing that revenue home with them uh, when, they, when they finish their trips. And so both of these types of places have the potential to generate economic spillover effects. Those, um, those port communities, potentially from those in, uh, indirect effects where they're purchasing inputs from upstream businesses, and they, then the induced effects. And then when fishermen return home, they have the potential to generate these induced effects too. Another area of the state that I think is worth highlighting is looking at some of the more rural boroughs or census areas in the state like Bristol Bay, the Lake and Penn Borough, and then the Aleutian Islands. We can see that there's a pretty large discrepancy there uh, between the value of fish that are caught by fishermen that live in those boroughs versus the value of fish that are landed there. So there are some really val valuable fisheries out in the Bering Sea and Aleutian Islands, crab and ground fish, for example, that are landed in, in harbors like uh, Dutch Harbor but aren't necessarily caught by fishermen that live in that same community. And so we can see that that drives this difference between uh, where fishermen live and are generating value uh, and where they're catching their fish or where they're landing their fish. Um, so those data that I just showed you come from the Commercial Fisheries Entry Commission. And these are one of the, the sources of kind of this cool Alaskan data that, that Ralph had mentioned in the introduction. So the CFEC is a, the state agency that's responsible for administering the state's limited entry program, uh, which is how the state manages some of its more valuable commercial species, species of fish like salmon. Um, but not all species um, that, are, that are caught in the state of Alaska um, are, are subject to this limited entry program, but the CFEC still collects a lot of data on those fisheries too. And so we're gonna use this database from CFEC to form the, uh, the basis of our fishing activity data. Uh, but then we also need some economic data too. Um, and as again, as Ralph mentioned, um, we also have um, some pretty cool data here um, that was created by the Alaska Department of Labor called the Alari database. What's nice about Alari is that they match unemployment insurance records with um, individuals' permanent fund dividend applications. What that allows us to do as researchers is trace jobs uh, to communities, not based on where the job is located, but where the person actually lives. And at the end of the day, when we do economic development or we're thinking about economic impacts, we often wanna think about um, the impact to the places where people live, not just the places where people work. And so, and so making that distinction is important. A lot of federally facilitated data just measure jobs based on where, um, where the job is located. And so being able to, to actually observe where the jobs are tied based, to, based on where the person lives is, is pretty unique to the state of Alaska and, and, and a really great uh, source of information for us. So Alari has data on uh, 344 communities in their database. We're gonna end up using data from about 200 of those communities. Um, a requirement for our statistical model, which I'll present in just a second, is that a community has to see uh, two consecutive years of commercial fishing activity in order for us to estimate a, an effect for them. And so, um, so about 200 communities in the state of Alaska met that criteria. Um, so our data is going to cover the, the period of 2000 to 2015. Those were just the years of data that were available from Alari when we, uh, when we conducted the study. 
Uh, so that's the time period of our analysis here. Uh, we're gonna supplement some of this data uh, with some other economic information, for example, from the IRS's statistics of income data, uh, which report um, adjusted gross income uh, for every county in the United States annually. Uh, not to bore you guys too much with the, the details of the statistical model, like I said, I can kind of geek out on this stuff a little bit, um, but I'd be happy to talk more about the details um, offline with folks that are interested. Um, but just to give you a sense of, of kind of what we're doing here, uh, we're going to draw a model um, specification from a paper that was written by Encino Moretti in 2010. And what Moretti was trying to do was estimate what's called a multiplier effect for manufacturing employment in the United States. And, and the, way, the way that we think about multiplier effects or what a multiplier effect is, is it's the number of jobs that are created in, 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 in the economy when one job is created in the manufacturing sector. So for example, if we find a multiplier effect of two, that means that for every manufacturing job that's created because of a new processing plant opening up, then that's two jobs that are created in other places in the economy. So we're going to be estimating something that's kind of like a multiplier effect. So I put multiplier in quotes here. Um, the difference between what we're estimating and a multiplier, we're, what we're estimating in a multiplier effect um, more technically is um, a little bit too in the weeds, I think, uh, for this talk today. Um, but suffice it to say, what we're estimating is kind of close to a multiplier, but not exactly. And so I don't, I don't want to create too much confusion there. Uh, we get close, but it's not quite. I also want to spend a second talking about um, the difference between correlation and causation. Um, whenever, uh, whenever you see somebody present uh, statistical results, this is always something that should be at the forefront of, of your minds, and is certainly as a practitioner is always at the forefront of mine. Um, so we're estimating a statistical model here, which means that we're going to be looking at correlations. Uh, but we want to say something beyond just correlation. We want to try to make some causal statements here. And so to do that, we've got to we've got to kind of pursue a more rigorous set of protocols um, than just looking at these baseline relationships. So why is that important? Well, if we were to just uh, look at the relationship between commercial fishing activity and local economic outcomes, uh, we might see a positive relationship, right? And that might make sense because, you know, as the fishery does well, it spills over into the rest of the economy, and the rest of the economy performs well too. This is kind of the uh, what we think about when we think about these multiplier or spillover effects. But that positive relationship might actually be because the relationship goes the other direction, and that would be potentially problematic for us. So why might economic activity cause more fishing activity? Well, fishing is a pretty expensive pursuit. Um, there's a lot of equipment that you have to buy, you've got to hire people, you've got to buy fishing permits or quota, and all of that can add up. So it could be the case that um, let's say uh, the price of oil goes up quite a bit and there's a lot more economic opportunity in a community. Um, oil field workers are getting really big bonuses and they're gonna take those bonuses and maybe buy a new fishing boat or buy new fishing equipment. Uh, and you know, they're able to balance these two jobs effectively. And so it could be the case that the positive relationship that we estimate statistically is just a result of, of that, uh, of, of the relationship flowing that other direction, the one that we don't necessarily want. Um, and so we're gonna take a couple of different approaches to addressing that problem, to try to say something beyond just pure correlation here, to say something causal. And in my opinion, this is one of the most fun and exciting parts of the paper is the way that we address this particular problem. Uh, we use a strategy called a shift shear instrument or a Bartik instrument. There's a lot of new research and exciting research that's been done that's kind of put some, some scrutiny and additional tests that you can employ to make sure that you're really getting good estimates that are generated from, from this type of approach. And again, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna bore folks too much with the details here, but just suffice it to say that this is something that we've thought about. I think it's one of the cool parts of the paper. If you're interested in more of the specifics there, you should feel free to reach out to me and I'd be happy to talk more about it. All right, so now let's talk uh, about the really fun stuff here, which is, which is what we find after we estimate the statistical model. Um, so we're gonna look at two sets of economic outcomes. We're gonna look at employment outcomes and we're gonna look at income outcomes. And we're gonna use two different units uh, here when we make, them, uh, when we make these measurements. Um, employment, we're gonna estimate in jobs per million dollars of fishing activity terms. And then for income and wages, we're gonna estimate those uh, in dollars per dollar term. So just note the different units there. We're gonna measure these two types of, um, 
two types of outcomes for, uh, for different components of the economy. Um, so on the employment front, we're gonna measure uh, several direct types of effects. So we're gonna look at crew workers that work on the, the vessels and help the, the fishing permit owner harvest the catch. And then we're gonna look at processing workers. These are the folks that are um, you know, processing the fish when they arrive at the ports, uh, heading them, gutting them, packaging them, getting ready for them to sell. Um, but quite a few of Alaska's processing workers are actually based outside the state. Something like 80% of Alaska's processing workers are actually not residents of Alaska. And so um, we wanna try to take this into account and decompose uh, processing labor into both an Alaska resident component and a non-resident component. So we'll look at those separately. So those are the direct effects. Then we'll look at the spillover uh, indirect and induced effects by zooming out and looking at all employment across the entire local economy uh, to look for these spillover effects. Then we'll kind of decompose those total spillover effects into two main sectors of the economy, the traded sector and the non-traded sector. In Alaska, the traded sector of the economy is mostly oil and gas jobs, um, but there's also important traded sector jobs in mining, timber harvest, uh, commercial fishing uh, in the processing sector, and then a little bit of agriculture. Uh, the non-traded sector is just all other parts of the economy. So we're gonna break, uh, break these spillover effects into those two constituent parts. Then we'll look at, I think, ultimately what matters at the end of the day, it's great that people have jobs, but people want paychecks. And so we'll also look at income and wage effects of, of commercial fishing activity. As I mentioned, one of the key questions that we're interested in here is the geography of where these benefits are accruing. So we're gonna look separately at these effects based on where fishermen live and then where they land their catch. All right, so let's take a look at, at the results that we get um, when we estimate the relationship between uh, fishing activity and these different economic outcomes based on these two, uh, two geographic definitions. So when we look at the effect of an additional million dollars of fish harvest based on where fishermen live, we see about 3.4 new crew jobs that are created for each of those million dollars based on where those fishermen live in the same communities uh, that the crew live in. On the other hand, we estimate that there's about 1.4 jobs uh, created in, uh, in, in uh, crew harvesting uh, where those fish are landed. Uh, so let's take an example. Uh, let's think about the community of Homer for a minute. What our estimates suggest is that for fishermen that live in the community of Homer, uh, for every million dollars of, of, of revenue that those fishermen are catching out in the ocean, there's about 3.4 crew jobs for uh, crew members that live in Homer that are generated in that same community. Now contrast this uh, with the result that we're getting on the landing side. This means that for every million dollars of fish that are landed in Homer, there are about 1.4 crew jobs created for uh, residents of the community of Homer. So we, we can see there that there's already this difference between the impact um, of where, fish are or, uh, where the fishermen live versus where they're landing catch on this particular outcome. Uh, we find kind of the opposite though, when we look at processing labor. And I think that this is, this is somewhat intuitive, um, but for every million dollars of additional uh, of fish that are fish value that are landed in, in the community, we find about nine additional jobs in the processing sector. Um, that approximate zero there on the, the, the live side uh, of the ledger, that just means that we didn't find a statistically significant effect there. So I'm calling that approximately zero here. Of course, in the statistical sense, that's not quite true. Uh, but I think for the context of this presentation, we can just say that it's uh, uh, about zero or, or we weren't able to detect an effect there. Um, and so I think that both of these results are fairly intuitive and consistent with, um, a, you know, kind of conventional, uh, conventional wisdom here. Um, based on the anecdotal evidence that I hear, you know, uh, fishermen like to hire crew that uh, they know, sometimes they're family members, friends, maybe neighbors. And so maybe it's not surprising that those crew jobs are coming mostly from where the fishermen are living, where those processing jobs are accruing mostly where the fish are being landed. So as I mentioned, one of the things that we want to do here is decompose that processing labor component into Alaska and non-Alaska uh, resident components. So are these jobs going to residents or folks from outside the state? As I mentioned, there's quite a pretty significant contingent of, of non-Alaska resident processing labor. Uh, we basically find no effect for Alaska residents. Um, 
when additional catch is either uh, harvested or landed into a community. Um, instead, most of the additional processing jobs that are created uh, when new catch is landed are going to non-resident workers. And again, just because of this large chunk of these non-resident processing workers, I think that that makes sense. So those are the direct effects. So we have direct effects in this crew harvest sector. Uh, we have direct effects in total processing. Obviously, they're a little bit different for uh, Alaska residents versus non-residents based on where fishermen live or where they land catch. But are there any spillover effects from, um, from this activity into, into indirect or induced effects? And so we look at all employment across the entire community based on where fish, fishermen live or where they land catch. And so we do find spillover effects. Uh, we find that for every million dollars um, of catch that's harvested by fishermen in a community, uh, employment in the fishermen's home community uh, increases by about seven jobs. Um, on the landing side, we find about a two job increase for every million dollars of harvest that's landed into a port community. Um, and so that, that suggests that there are, are potentially these spillover effects um, from commercial harvesting activity or from commercial fishing activity. So what sectors are, are generating this, uh, this activity? Is it coming from the traded sector, which as I mentioned, are those oil and gas jobs, which you know, um, maybe wouldn't make sense to be positively impacted by commercial fishing, but we could imagine that there potentially being a negative effect from commercial fishing if, you know, commercial fishing becomes really attractive because there's a big boom in the sector and maybe people um, want to leave their jobs on the slope to go work in the fishery. Uh, so there might be a negative relationship there, uh, but that's not what we find. In fact, we don't find any, any evidence either way, uh, nothing statistically significant in the traded sector. Um, which means, or which implies from our previous estimate that all the spillover effects must be occurring in the non-traded sector, um, probably into indirect and induced jobs. And these are particularly concentrated again, based on where the fishermen live. So what that suggests is that when these fishermen are returning home uh, with their income, they're spending it in their local economies um, and potentially jo generating jobs in sectors like uh, retail, housing, um, or hospitality. So like I said, uh, jobs are great, um, but money is better. Um, everybody wants to come home with a paycheck at the end of the day. So how much money is being generated um, by additional fisheries revenue and how much is, it, is sticking into these communities? <clears throat> so using that data from the IRS, uh, we estimate that for every dollar of revenue that fishermen bring home, there's about a dollar fifty in income that's reported to the IRS. So that includes that $1 of income that the fisherman is earning. And so for every dollar of, of revenue, there's about 50 cents of, of spillover income uh, that's being generated uh, by that harvest activity. Again, where the fishermen live. If we look at where the uh, fish are being landed though, we find a number that's significantly less than one. Um, in fact, that, that, that estimate of 0 0.7 or seven cents is statistically insignificant, but I wanted to show it here for, for illustrative purposes. Um, what that implies, because that number is less than one, it means that much of the money that is um, being generated when fish are getting landed in a port is leaking out of that community. And so what do I mean by leakage? Um, I just mean that if we think about it, um, if a lot of the processing workers are residents uh, or non-Alaska residents, you know, they might spend a little bit of money in the local economy, but they're also gonna take a significant chunk of their wages home with them when they leave. Um, a lot of processors aren't owned by residents of, of that same community. Uh, a lot of processors are owned by uh, folks that live in Anchorage or businesses based in Seattle. Some of them are publicly traded, and so their owners are, um, you know, dispersed across the country and across the world. And so it's potentially not surprising that we find pretty limited income effects from landings um, in these poor communities. Uh, we find a statistically insignificant effect for wages specifically, which just suggests to us that a lot of these additional revenue that's being created or additional income that's being generated where the fishermen live is uh, business income. All right, so let's take these results and put them back into the context of those three questions that we asked at the beginning of the talk. So does fishing activity spill over into wage and employment outcomes in other sectors? Uh, we find that, yes, it does, um, obviously with the caveats of, of uh, where the fishermen live versus where they're landing catch. So we find spillover effects for employment and income. We asked what sectors are most affected. Uh, we find that it's the non-traded sectors in the communities of residents for um, uh, the fishermen uh, that are most affected. And then that, of course, previews where these benefits are accruing, which is that most of them happen or seem to happen where the fishermen live. 
one of the things that I think is pretty cool about this result or, or interesting about it, I should say, is that if you look at some of re the recent work that's been, do, uh, been done on um, where the benefits of fracking go, um, there's some pretty interesting recent papers that suggest that yes, um, places like the Bakken in North Dakota, which have experienced big booms from fracking, there's a lot of economic activity there. But if you actually trace the money, a lot of the spillover effects that are in, in total that are being generated if you follow the royalty checks back to the mineral rights owners in places like Houston and Dallas, you know, uh, so Oklahoma City, where a lot of these royalty owners actually live, there's spillover effects being generated there more so than they're being generated in the, um, the Bakken area itself. And so we're actually finding something that's somewhat of an analogous result on the fishery side, which is that these spillover effects um, seem to be much larger in the places where the fishermen reside rather than where the activity itself is taking place. And so we think that that's a, a neat complementary result and also pretty important potentially for discussions around fisheries management um, and economic development policy in the state. So I think it's worth mentioning a couple of important limitations of our study um, before we talk maybe about the, the implications. Um, one of the things that our study doesn't do is look at um, uh, tax effects. So um, cities, borough governments, and the state government collect a pretty significant amount of tax revenue um, from the landings of, of fish harvest. Um, these tax revenues are fairly difficult to trace. It might be, it's, it's somewhat easy to look up um, how much the community of Bristol Bay collected in tax revenue, but it's somewhat more difficult to, to assess exactly how state and local revenue sharing um, redirects the dollars that are generated, landed in Bristol Bay, then flow to the state government coffers and then flow back into the community. Um, because that process is fairly difficult to track, we ignored the tax effects in this paper, but I think that they're probably pretty important in this context. And it, again, a limitation of our study design. I've noted here that people that work for the city governments, they'll ha have important spillover effects um, from that tax revenue, but that's not something that we can trace. And it's potentially true that those jobs are more stable from year to year. Uh, whereas our study focuses more on those year to year fluctuations in employment. And then, as I mentioned, um, our study is short run in nature. So I, I talked at the top of the talk about the difference between the short run and the long run effects. Our study does not answer the question, what would happen if the Bristol Bay fishery were to disappear to the community of Bristol Bay? Bristol Bay would be worse off if that fishery closed, regardless of the particular estimates that, that we get in our study. So I think that that's, those are just a couple of issues worth flagging. Um, here before we talk about some of the implications. So I think that, I think that our study has uh, two potentially interesting areas of implication. One is for fisheries management, and then the other is for economic development. So on the management side, um, federal and state, uh, federal, uh, federal law, the state constitution, state law, and, um, regulator, or, um, and state regulation, they all suggest that um, benefits to local communities should be taken into account uh, when making uh, allocation decisions for fisheries policy. But one of the things that's, that's always, I think, or that, that is difficult in this context is just um, sometimes lacking information about exactly who is benefiting from this activity and in what way. And so that's one of the things that I hope that our study helps to make a contribution to as fisheries managers are making decisions is, you know, they are often called upon to prioritize these user groups. So for example, there's often discussions around whether to allocate, um, you know, certain species of fish to a commercial fishery versus uh, a sport fishery. And then what are the economic impacts of those various channels? And those are really difficult questions to answer. And so one of the things that I hope that, that our paper does is kind of takes a step forward in making a contribution to understanding those issues. And then I think on the economic development side, um, communities are often tasked with this, um, with, with the question of, you know, how do we grow our, our economy? How do we use the resources that we have to the benefits of the people that live in our community? And I think that one of the things that our paper does is, is highlight that difficulty um, in making some of these decisions. So communities often, for example, will co-invest um, uh, or make uh, or, or create tax uh, tax incentives for uh, local processing facilities to open up um, in their area. And I think one of one of the paper one of the things that our paper shows is some of the challenges associated with turning that that initial investment into these economic spillover effects downstream. 
And so that's just something that I think is worth highlighting as communities think about making some of these investments is, you know, how, how can we work to create more of these spillover effects in those communities where this processing activity is happening? And maybe that's potentially through something like capturing more of that value chain. So we talked about these indirect effects from a new processor opening. You know, how do we make sure that the inputs that a particular processor are, are using or maybe even are, are sourced in the community? How do we, how do we encourage more local, local labor hires? to go work in that process, processing facility? Um, can we create more value added in that processor um, by creating a, a more expensive product that's eventually sold maybe directly to the end user? These are all just potential ideas. And so, I, like I said, I, I hope that our, our paper and our, our research contributes to this broader conversation. I think it's just one of, of, of many things uh, that needs to be done in, in kind of this field of, of study. And it's one of the things that we hope to contribute more to in the future as ICER continues to do, um, I think, uh, really cool research on, on this front of, of state fisheries um, and, and local economic outcomes. So with that, I think it's, it's worth um, turning it over to our Q&A period. Um, I, I wanted to include some links here. Um, so if you're interested in, in reaching out to me and, and maybe having a follow-up conversation, I've included my email here. Um, and you can also follow me on Twitter. I, I uh, tweet a lot about, about Alaska fisheries issues on Twitter. And then there's also a link in these slides to the full version of the paper. If you're interested in, in looking at the paper, having access to these slides or reaching out to me, a lot of that contact info is gonna be posted in the webinar chat. And so with that, I think I'll turn it over to uh, Ralph, who's, who will facilitate our Q&A period. Well, Brett, right now there aren't any questions in the Q&A. Uh, you were obviously uh, brilliant and generated no questions, but, but I'll, I'll ask a couple, uh, and, and I think they might be ones that are on the minds of, of folks. And, and let me get to the first one, which often comes up in economic studies. And that is, you use data from 2000 to 2015. How come we're always stuck with old data? on economic studies? <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, no, that, that's a great question. I mean, so, um, you know, one of the things that we do in this paper is, it, is it, it, it really is a retrospective analysis. So when we do these statistical type studies, uh, we, I, I, I think that, I mean, the, um, the IO framework that you had mentioned is a little bit more perspective in nature, more forward looking, um, but as we, do analysis that's more forward looking, it often requires making more bold assumptions about the future. Looking backwards usually requires making fewer assumptions. We can let the past speak for itself. And so that's one of the reasons that we often have to rely on past data to answer some of these questions. On the specific question as to why, why, we, um, why we ended our study in 2015, um, I think that there might be a, f a couple of folks from the Department of Labor that are on. The Department of Labor needs more resources to continue this really important data set, Alari. Um, and so, I mean, Alaska has some really great opportunities to answer questions uh, related to fisheries and not um, using, uh, like I said, that cool linkage between the PFD data um, and the uh, UI filings in Alari. Um, and so I, I would I would hope that um, you know if there are any any legislators that are listening, um, <laughs> it, it would be great to to get more funding for the DOL um, to be able to continue that that database. Uh, Brett, a couple of questions have come in. Uh, this was actually on my list. Uh, can you explain to people uh, the, what you mean by traded and non-traded sectors of the economy? Yeah, of course. Um, so. Broadly speaking, we can kind of group um, economic activity into these two big categories. So there's all the stuff that an economy might make to try to sell or export somewhere else. Um, and then there are kind of the goods and services that are consumed more internally to an economy itself. And so that's just kind of a useful way to kind of break up economic activity into two broad groups. Um, so in Alaska, like I said, there's a lot of jobs in the traded sector. A lot of our economy is, is focused on creating exports that we then sell to the rest of the lower 48 or to, uh, to customers internationally. So that's oil and gas, mining, timber, and commercial seafood. Um, and so, so all I mean there is just to try to create these two large groupings of the economy in the traded and, and the non-traded sector. The non-traded sector, I think, represents a lot more of the conventional economic spillovers that we think about. But Thinking about what's going on in the traded sector is often important too. Um, people on the call might be familiar with the concept of the resource curse. 
which is the phenomenon where if a, co a, a country or a location becomes dependent on a natural resource, um, sometimes that can detract from other places in their economy that are export focused. And that creates a trade-off for them and, and creates the so-called resource curse as people leave the manufacturing sector and go into oil extraction, for example. What we find in our paper is at least in the short run um, that that trade-off doesn't exist or we don't find any evidence for that trade-off. And so I think that that is another, another useful thing, a finding of our study um, and maybe a byproduct of it. Um, there was a technical question about um, uh, the, the, the uh, person asked, I'm under the impression that CFEC data can undervalue at sea processed products that lack an ex vessel transaction. Uh, curious about your thoughts on the use of the CFEC data for this purpose. So the, the question of at sea, at sea processing. No, it, it, and, and that's a great, a great point is that catcher processor vessel sector. And so just, just to clarify, maybe for people who aren't as familiar with this, with this phenomenon, uh, there are lots of vessels or lots of large vessels, particularly out in the Bering Sea and Aleutian Islands in the pollock fishery, for example, that both catch and process fish on board. And then we'll often um, uh, put that fish on a tender vessel and export it straight away. And so very little of it actually makes landfall in Alaska. And the way that we thought about this, this issue is that, you know, if it's, um, if it's not, I mean, it, most of those, those vessels are owned by uh, companies that aren't necessarily based in Alaska. Most of that fleet is based out of Seattle. Um, and most of the workers that work on those vessels are also based outside the state. And so if a lot of the processing activity is happening offshore, all the harvesting activities operating offshore, and then most of the ownership is based not in Alaska, it's just hard for me to think about where or how, how local economies in the state of Alaska might interact the most directly with that catcher processor fleet. Um, but I think, I think it's an important question and a limitation of our study, honestly, um, and it probably should have been noted in that slide, but I, I think it's a great point. So the, um, this perhaps gets into the question of uh, uh, the definition of fisheries landings that you are using is the landings of both state, what we would call both state and federal fisheries, but it's data that's reflected in the CFEC uh, landings and processing data. Is that? Is that's that right. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So, so it does not include the at sea process. Well, it does not include the at sea processed uh, fish unless it's landed in Alaska. That, that's right. Yeah. And, and, and like I said, it's, it's, it's difficult for me to think about how to allocate that, um, that catcher processor value to different local communities in the state of Alaska. I mean, there might be some processes that we could think about, but um, I, I'd be happy for, for folks to, if they have um, specific feedback on that point, to reach out directly to me. I have a couple of questions here about um, the level of uh, specificity that you're able to do with your approach. Specifically, is it, is it possible to uh, look at different species, for example, is there a difference between salmon and crab? Uh, and the second one is, is it, does this, is this methodology something that can tell us uh, for particular communities, what is the impact? So it's kind of what's, how, how hard can we push this data in terms of getting detailed answers? No, and, and that's a great question. And, and something that we, we really tried to do in the paper um, and, and uh, you know, somewhat honestly, uh, somewhat unsuccessfully, um, was to, to, to really drill down um, to the community level or the borough level uh, to try to estimate community specific impacts of these things. Um, that ended up pushing the data a little bit too far. Um, at the species level, I actually don't think that that was something that we tried, um, uh, disaggregating by species to look at impacts. Um, but it's certainly an interesting point. Um, and I think one, one I think that, that is well taken because um, certainly different species have different, um, different crew requirements, different processing intensities um, are more or less facilitated by this onshore or offshore behavior. Um, one of the things that I will say though, is that one probably could take our estimates and look at how they would affect different communities based on that local uh, fisherman presence. Um, and so, so the, the general conclusion that we draw from our paper is that having a strong uh, local fisherman fleet uh, 
um, is somewhat more important than having um, kind of a large processor presence, just in terms of generating those spillover effects. And so you can imagine the types of communities that fill, fit into those two categories and sort of start to think about that, that heterogeneity across the types of communities in Alaska. More resident fishermen, the better. Again, I have a specific question about uh, your data and measuring crew data. Um, obviously, there's always an issue about covered employment versus self-employment in a number of the, uh, particularly the, the nearest shore fisheries. So can you talk about how well you think your crew data actually catches, to uh, captures uh, total crew employment? Uh, great point. Um... Yeah, so we we our our crew data came from the um, Alaska Department of Fish and Games database. They produce um, they produce annual estimates of the number of licensed crew members um, based on the address that those crew members provide um, when they file for an application, uh, a permit, crew license permit. Um, and so, you know, th those data are as high quality as the information that's given to Alaska Department of Fish and Game. And 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 the, as the the questioner rightly points out, there's likely some error in, in those data. Um, misreporting of, of home residents of, of, of crew, um, and then some, some folks that are kind of operating under the table. Um, you, you touched on uh, the study that had been done in the, uh, the Bakken in North Carolina along those same lines, where is the impact? Are there other studies that um, get into measuring how the, the impacts between where owners live and where employ where the economic activity or where owners and employers live, employees live and where an economic activity takes place. Are there other studies of that sort? I, I can't think of any off the top of my head. Uh, the reason that I cited that one is it came out uh, very recently in the last year or so um, by a few authors that I really respect. Um, and I just had the opportunity to interact uh, with them at a, at a conference recently and was talking about some of our research and they were kind of talking about how it rhymed with some of the work that they were doing. And, and like I said, I, I think that that's kind of exciting just as we think about these broader implications of the interactions between um, natural resources and local economies and how, how I, like I said, there's kind of these rhymes between them um, as, as we kind of drill into more specific sectors. Um, I, I think that that's interesting. And um, I, I don't know, I, I think could be the basis of future work in, in other natural resource sectors to see if, if those same patterns emerge. So an opportunity for potential research there. I guess I'll close with a, a question about, um, your analysis comes up with an estimate per community, but obviously communities aren't homogenous. Uh, a community, if a, if a, a, a fisher lives in Anchorage, they can buy most of the things they want in Anchorage. If they live in uh, a, a, a small rural community, uh, they may not be able to buy many of the things that they need. They may have to uh, buy them in Anchorage and have them flown in or, or, or whatever. So are there diff sh should we expect, did your analysis get into the question of, uh, is the impact of uh, these economic impacts of, of where people live does it does it is it likely to vary by uh, the type of the community and uh, if so does your study get at any of that in any way yeah I mean it, I, that was a hypothesis that we tested unfortunately we weren't able to draw any um, uh, any robust conclusions from it um, I, there potentially is just too much underlying too many underlying differences between these communities, even after we grouped them. So we, we tried to split the day, data every way we could think of, um, but particularly across the dimensions that you mentioned, which is kind of the more rural versus urban communities in the state, um, and weren't able to draw any, any, um, any robust conclusions from that analysis. But I, I think that it's a really important point, which is just that some communities are really, I think, set up to take these spillover effects. They've got these linkages throughout the economy. They've got robust retail and, and leisure sectors where, where people can spend dollars at. And some communities just aren't equipped for that. And so this is the Alaska leakage problem more generally that a lot of the dollars leave the state pretty quickly because so much of, so much of the stuff that we buy in the state needs to be imported, um, the goods. And obviously that applies at a more local level as well. So, but so, it's a great question, yeah. 
So, so I can I can spend my money at the local Walmart, but the markup at the Walmart is pretty small. The money is really going out of state, anyways. Is that sort of the point? Yeah, that that's right. Well, we're at the end of our hour. Thank you very much, Brett, for uh, presenting this work and for uh, taking the time to answer some of the questions that came up. Again, folks have on the screen uh, some contact information uh, uh, to contact Brett if you have follow-ups. I know from the list of participants, there are some folks out there who I'm sure will love to get down and dirty with Brett about the technical details, the data, and the estimation. And please do feel free to reach out for Brett. That. So thank you very much for joining us uh, today, and hopefully we'll see some of you at uh, future ICER webinars. Um, thank, thank you all for joining us today. I, I really appreciate it. And again, if you have any follow-up questions, uh, my contact info is, is on the chat. So thank you all. Bye-bye.